So today we're going to start with the problem we did, uh, the clicker question from Friday. Now last week we started and uh, finished up chapter one. One of the things I want you guys to focus on is the um, unit dimension analysis. So the dimensional analysis or unit conversion. We went over that on Friday. And this is the question, the last question, clicker question of the day. And this kind of covered uh, everything that we talked about on Friday. What we need to talk about and what we need to focus on is what units do we start with and what units do we end with and how we get there. So we start with inches cubed and this is important. So if you see inches cubed, this is a derived unit, meaning there is a mathematical or um, uh, operation that is performed. In this case, it's inches times inches times inches. So whatever co unit conversion we have, we need to take into account that it is cubed. <clears throat> so how did we get there? So the important thing is to start with what you're given and if there is a direct uh, unit conversion, then it's a one-step process. However, if you look on the unit um, conversion page that we uh, passed out on Friday, you see there's not a direct conversion between inches to millimeters. However, there is a conversion between inches to centimeters. And there's a conversion between centimeters two meters and meters to millimeters. Now once you start getting used to the prefixes and the metric system, um, you might can skip a step and go from centimeters to millimeters, but until you're comfortable with those units, um, breaking it into step by step is probably, probably the best way to avoid mistakes. So we see here that we start with what's given, which is inches cubed. Now on your sheet, there isn't inches cubed to centimeters cubed, but there is inches to centimeters. And remember, we treat units just like we treat numbers, and vice versa. So in this case, our inches is cubed, so everything within the parentheses must be cubed also. So we can't just put a cube here and treat it the same, because here, what this is reading is this is inches times inches times inches, which gives us a volume. Here, this is 2.54 times 2.54 times 2.54, which gives us centimeters cubed. And whatever we do to one uh, part, we have to do to all. So in this case, we went from, uh, from inches to inches cubed two centimeters cubed. And to convert from centimeters cubed to meters, we know that there are 100 centimeters within one meter. And all of this has to be cubed. Just like going from meters to millimeters cubed, again, everything has to be cubed. So we see that the inches cubed get canceled out, the centimeters cubed get canceled out, and then the meters cubed gets canceled out. And so we're left with millimeters cubed. And so um, if you kept your work from Friday, the correct answer is B, 7.104 times 10 to the 6 millimeters cubed. And remember, this is um, scientific notation, which takes into account the... So that's the answer, and we get our significant figures by the inches and in what we're given. Because recall that the conversion between the centimeters and inches is an exact number, along with any conversion between metric and metric. And exact numbers do not affect the final significant figures. If you need any help, remember that uh, the quiz one is due tomorrow. Um, uh, Tuesday, and that um, homework for Chapter 1 is due this Friday. Homework for Chapter 2 is open now, um, and we'll be 
do some time next week, depending how this week goes. So today we're going to start in chapter two, and chapter two deals with the periodic table and how we can use it. Now the periodic table we know today hasn't always been constructed the same way. So the early version of the periodic table was actually arranged by the atomic mass. And if you recall from chapter zero, the atomic mass is the summation of all the isotopes and their relative abundance. And while for the most part as atomic number increases, the atomic mass increase, there are some areas of the periodic table that we know today that shows that that's not always the case. But Mendeleev and Meyer um, started noticing that there were some trends in some of the elements, how they behave, their properties, and things like that. And so they started rearranging the periodic table to go by the atomic number, because that, that number does just increase. And they rearranged the periodic table to take into account these repeating properties and trends. So the periodic table we know today, the rows are called periods, and the columns are called groups or families. And each period has similar properties or trends, and each column has um, different properties and trends. And so for the most part, um, we will refer to the columns as 1A through 8A, which are the longer, um, larger columns, and then 1B to 8B in the shorter columns. So what about these trends? Well, one of the trends we noticed, or they noticed, is after organizing it by atomic number, they noticed that some properties of elements react more like metals, while some of them are not really reactive. Um, and but one of the example is lithium, sodium, and potassium. So all of these are metals, but they are all soft, and they're very reactive. So if you have ever seen um, metal being thrown into water, that is very reactive. You see sparks and flames. And that's probably something in the same group as lithium, sodium, and potassium. However, they notice that some elements, such as helium, neon, and argon, were not really reactive and are always found in gases. So in addition to uh, arranging an increasing atomic number, they started organizing it by these trends. And so they placed similarly behaved elements in vertical columns, what we call groups. And like I mentioned before in chapter zero, the periodic table is the best cheat sheet a chemist could have. And we'll learn more about this in chapter seven, but the arrangement of the periodic table can tell you many, many things. Um, Besides looking at what we learned in chapter zero, the, each square has the, a lot of information about the element. So it has the atomic number, the chemical symbol, and the atomic mass. And depending what kind of periodic table you have, you might get more information, um, and sometimes less, unfortunately. But most basic periodic tables have these three uh, identifiers. <coughs> and you'll also see um, them numbered 1A and 8A, along with a lower um, a lower column, um, which are referred to the B elements. And some of these groups have specific names, and yes, you will be required to know them. So you will need to know the groups, the alkali metals, the alkaline metals, the noble gases, and the halogens. You need to know their locations and um, 
the majority of the elements which, within each group. Additionally, the elements in the center is called the transition metals. And then you have the lanthanides and the actinides. You'll notice this one's color coded because you can see where the lanthanides start. And if you actually go in onto uh, the third floor in front of room 307, you can see the periodic table um, expanded. Uh, but for the most part, and for uh, easy viewing, we have the lanthanides and the actinides um, outside, but it, they do belong here. And what you'll see, so we continue on, that these groups have similarly behaved elements. So like we talked about before, we notice that um, lithium, sodium, potassium, and so forth, they all were reactive, and so they were placed in a column. Now do note that um, the alkali metals do not include hydrogen, okay? Hydrogen is not a metal, but the location of hydrogen is very important and it's placed there, and we'll learn more about that in Chapter 7. So again, please be um, aware of the group names. Now, Group 6A, which starts with oxygen, is a lesser known name, um, but these are the main names for the groups that um, might come up on the periodic, uh, on the ACS exam at the end of the year. So here's a color-coded one that uh, really simplifies the periodic table, but uh, into you metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. So this staircase separates the metals and the nonmetals. However, some elements that are law that are along uh, the staircase sometimes has or has some metal properties but also has some non-metal properties and we call those metalloids. Also please note that hydrogen is blue meaning that it is a non-metal. <coughs> so one of the properties of non-metal and again don't forget hydrogen is they come in all of the phases, solid, liquids, and gases, and they do not conduct electricity or heat. So if it does not conduct, we call that an insulator. And they're usually found in compounds or mixtures or molecules. So when we talk about diatomic uh, elements, these are the non-metals. The metalloids, and there are eight elements shown in red, are semiconductors, so that means they do conduct electricity and heat, however, they do not conduct it very well. So they have properties similar to nonmetals and metals, so they can be slightly um, metallic colored and shiny, but not always. The properties of metals, besides being shiny, um, is that they're ductile, and they do conduct electricity and heat very well. And all of them are solid except for mercury. And mercury's ke uh, chemical symbol is Hg. They're also reactive um, and react easily with other elements. Some metals that you need to pay attention to is the transition metals. So remember back um, in the first couple lectures, we talked about what happens if you increase or decrease the amount of electrons. So increasing, taking away electrons uh, causes a positive charge. Now most of these groups have a singular charge. However, the transition metals can lose electrons uh, can lose different amounts of electrons. The inner transition metals are the lanthanides and the actinides, and we're not really going to cover those. 